So, thank you for uh, finding your way here to the meat locker. We'll be uh, working our way through. You know we are in Mark's Gospel, and we are at that rather dramatic moment when Jesus has just been arrested and hauled off to what amounts to a kind of quasi-arraignment in front of what's called the Sanhedrin, but we know it's not an official gathering of the Sanhedrin because it's not taking place in the official venue for meetings of the Sanhedrin, which was called the Chamber of Hewn Stone. It's rather taking place in the cellar of the home of Caiaphas, which had been set up to be the location where sort of non-public trials would take place. Jesus wasn't the only one who'd been subjected to a kind of examination under torture in this particular spot. This was sort of like a star chamber, if you know that expression from merry old England, a kind of private place where trials would take place and due process was more or less neglected. And that's where Jesus is taken. And those who are on the Sanhedrin who are sympathetic to Caiaphas's hostility to Jesus are there, not the whole body probably, but certainly a respectable number. And in this gathering, Caiaphas has tried to assemble a case against Jesus, testimonies from witnesses, but they don't add up. They're not consistent with one another. And finally, Caiaphas just puts the question directly to Jesus. And this would be in an arraignment kind of situation. How do you plead? You know, guilty or not guilty? You've heard the charges. What are you going to say for yourself? And Jesus, of course, says nothing to the frustration of Caiaphas. And it's at that moment that we now pick up the story. So, in the hopes that our technology works, we are right at that moment. We actually dropped it midstream last time, right in the middle of this paragraph, with the question that was put to Jesus by Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest and he asked these words. This is Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 60, halfway through the paragraph, the Word of God. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered, Nothing. Again the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ? the Son of the Blessed. Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy, what do you say? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him, and to blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say to him, prophesy! And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. This gripping moment will cover more than this, this morning. We're also going to cover Peter's denial, which takes place outside him. But for now, we'll confine our attention here. Let's uh, have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Father, we look with astonishment at this remarkable moment. and We think to ourselves, how could they do that to him? But then if we look a little more deeply, we realize that had we been there, we'd be with them, doing the same things. And as much as it breaks our heart to recognize that, it also gives us great hope to realize that it's by grace that we have been saved. And that was not of ourselves, it was your gift. We pray that we would get a new insight into that gift as we look at this moment of crisis, 
which led to a moment of victory not long later. And for that, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my uh, complicated outline, but you've seen it enough times, you can kind of wind your way through. We're in the red line at the bottom there. The covenant, I'm saying, is being acknowledged in this trial, not by Jesus, though he certainly does, but by his enemies. They're the ones who are now going to acknowledge in no uncertain terms who Christ is and by so doing acknowledge all that's really happening in this process. So I'm calling this the Messiah arraigned. How do you plead? The question in a sense that's being put to him. The high priest stood up in the midst. Do you answer nothing? What is it all these people have said against you? The high priest, as we say, Joseph Caiaphas is his name, the son-in-law of the man who was regarded as the true high priest, Annas. It's in the basement of his house where excavations have discovered this little trial area. There were posts where people could be lashed and questioned under torture, and we assume Jesus was going through something like that here. How do you plead, Jesus? You've heard what these people have said. What do you have to say for yourself? And Jesus, of course, says nothing. And then the high priest asks this question, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? That's a Jewish circumlocution for God. They didn't want to say God, the name was too holy, so they would say the Blessed One or the Power or use some other expression to avoid saying the holy name. So here's Jesus, dignified, quiet, in the midst of what appears to be adolescent taunts by these who are supposed to be the most dignified fiduciaries of Jewish law and jurisprudence. The contrast couldn't be more striking. He is quiet in the face of this ridicule and abuse, fully realizing what had been predicted long ago by Isaiah, especially chapter 53, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Not that he couldn't have said some things, you know. It wasn't that Jesus was tongue-tied at the moment. Jesus had been confronted with these kind of critical carping, nitpicking experts who wanted to catch him in his words, who wanted to embarrass him in front of the crowds, who wanted to trap him in some little inconsistency. It really reminds me of the press these days and the way they deal with politicians they don't like. You know, they just look for anything that they can find that's the least little bit of an inconsistency and make a mountain out of a molehill. And these guys were doing that in even greater proportions as they were trying to find something that they could make stick and they never could because whenever Jesus was confronted by them in this way he just sort of soared above their critical questions not only responding to them but giving vastly greater wisdom and insight on the topics than was within the scope of their questions and so we know he could do it but at this point he judiciously chooses not to and simply remains quiet. He probably was following his own counsel not to cast his pearls before swine. You know, sometimes it's a time to speak, and sometimes silence is golden, and a wise person can sometimes tell the difference. One commentator made an interesting observation about this moment, saying, it was true of Jesus, no one spoke like him. It was equally true no one was silent like him. We should remember when the church is attacked in this manner, the positive deeds of effective service in Christ's name do not need words of defense. He continues, if half the time and strength which Christians have given to noisy and verbose argument had been given to quiet, insistent, continuous ministries, of love, the cause of Christ would have carried a far greater power of persuasion. Jesus responded to John, the blind received their sight, 
the lame walk, you know. These guys come from John the Baptist. Are you the one that's coming or we're looking for someone else? When are you going to get with it? You know, where's the fireworks? Come on, Jesus, you're the Messiah and all that. And Jesus could have put on quite a theological apologetic at that point. He could have given these guys a lecture, explained, you know, who he is and what it's about. But he simply responds very quietly. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. The words were unnecessary in the light of the works. And the church at her best in history, as you know, has made service its calling card. Going into places of desperate need, the first thing the church has done has typically not been, when she's at her best, start preaching sermons, but rather building clinics and building hospitals and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and earning the right to be heard and giving credibility to the message that's being provided. And so for us to be able to make that difference is one of the great marks of maturity in our Christian ministry. I loved it when I first joined this church back in 1980, and the pastor was Dick Leon. Some of you were here clear back then. And he liked to use this metaphor. I heard him use it many times. The gospel walks on two legs. He'd use this little symbol. Works, words. Works, words. You speak, but you serve. You serve and you speak. And those two supplement each other and it's what gives potency to our labors as christian people jesus here of course had provided many works that was well known nobody doubted it but at this point the words were superfluous and so he remains quiet and now this most remarkable moment now it's always translated as a question But actually, if you just read it straight out of the Greek, it's not a question at all. It's simply a statement. What Caiaphas said to Jesus is, you are the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One. You're the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One. It's a statement which represents a certain kind of question. It's called a leading question. Leading questions are simply statements that are calculated to force the witness to agree. When I was practicing law, I went to a great continuing legal education seminar in Seattle. There were these two guys who traveled the country. They'd written a book on how to do a cross-examination. That's really the test of a good litigator. Can you cross-examine effectively, you know? And it was a very delightful and entertaining uh, uh, seminar. And uh, in this seminar, these two guys who would role play different situations kept making the point that the heart of effective cross-examination is the leading question. And they spent probably eight hours talking about how to do leading questions. You wouldn't think it'd be that tough, would you? But you know, there's a lot to it. And how you can ask them in a sequence that basically drags a reluctant, hostile witness from where they are to where they don't want to go. And you just drag them along with these leading questions, giving them no out, you know. And, you know, a leading question is just a statement. If I ask you, what is your name? That's one question. If I say, your name is John Blow, you know, that's something. You live at such and so. You drive such and so a car. You are at a certain place. You know, I just make statements. And in a sense, you've got no option but to just keep agreeing. In fact, one of the things these guys said in the seminar was, in a trial, the jury gradually gets focused on the lawyer and forgets the witness because it's the lawyer that's testifying. The lawyer's giving all the information and the witness is really left in the position of simply having to affirm step by step down to, many times, conclusions they would prefer to avoid. The lawyer is testifying. Here's Joseph Caiaphas, a master lawyer, the high priest, using a tactic that has been around for millennia, the leading question, and what's interesting is he, at this point, is testifying. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He wants Jesus to agree because he wants Jesus to commit blasphemy. You see? How do you plead? And now he's going to put a very sharp point on this question 
by framing it just this way. It's interesting throughout Mark's gospel, that has been the question bouncing around since chapter one. Nobody who is a player in the script has really answered it until Caesarea Philippi, but others have. The demons in chapter one said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. God the Father spoke at the baptism of Jesus, you are my son, my beloved one. The disciples asked the question when they were out in the boat and Jesus calmed the storm with a word, who is this? Who is this man? But finally, when we get to Caesarea Philippi, we have the first confession of Jesus' identity by a player in the story, by Peter. And you're well aware that Peter says in Mark chapter 8, you are the Christ. We're going to have another statement made late in Mark's gospel. We haven't gotten to it yet but it's by the centurion who's standing at the foot of the cross. This is a culminating moment for Mark's gospel. Standing there at the foot of the cross, the centurion who is a hardened executioner, he has presided over a bunch of crucifixions because this was a common form of execution used by the Romans as a deterrent, a disincentive for you to go out and commit street crimes because you're gonna wind up like this, you know, and folks, paid attention when they saw that. And so he's seen a whole lot of people crucified. He's seen the anguish, the pain, the unspeakable horror of that ghastly kind of execution. And he's arrested by this unique individual, the things he says. And just before Jesus died, Mark tells us that Jesus yelled out with a loud cry, a great cry. Many read that and take it to be a cry of anguish. Albert Schweitzer said it was a cry of despair. Others have taken that view. It was not at all any of those things. The phrase Mark uses there is the kind of word you would use to describe a warrior who's gone into a battle and fought successfully and victoriously, and when the dust settles and the battle's over and he's standing out there in victory, he gives a battle cry that would be something like, yes, you see, just a big announcement of victory on the battlefield. That's the phrase. Jesus is on the cross He's just gone through hell, multiple hells poured out on him and the wrath of God for our sins. And when it's all finished and he can say it is finished, he gives a battle cry of exclamation and positive affirmation that he accomplished it, you see. And then he voluntarily surrenders his spirit. And a centurion watched that and said, that guy was the son of God. <laughs> how, else do you, how else do you account for this? There's every reason to believe that that centurion became a believer in the one that he had just executed for the sins that he himself had committed, including the sin of executing the son of God. What's interesting is the middle confession is by Joseph Caiaphas. And notice he combines the two. You are the Christ. That was what Peter said. You are the son of the blessed one, equivalent to what the centurion said. Caiaphas puts them together and makes the most comprehensive, single announcement of the identity of Christ anywhere in the Gospel of Mark. The New Covenant acknowledged the identity of Christ stated as a question in a trial. And when Jesus hears that, he breaks his silence and says, Ego a me. That, of course, is the Greek translation. He probably answered that question in Aramaic. We don't know, but certainly it's most likely. But Mark strategically uses this Greek phrase, Ego, we have the word ego, of course, from that, a me. A me by itself means I am. Ego a me is emphatic, I am. 
in the Greek Old Testament, the most commonly used form of the Old Testament, even in Palestine in the first century, this was the name for God. Yahweh, I am, was the Hebrew. Egoemi is the Greek. I am. And so when Caiaphas puts the question to Jesus, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? Jesus responds with nothing less than a title and claim to deity. Ego, a me. I am. And then Jesus, interestingly, adds to the two titles already in play, the Christ, the Son of God, a third title, which would really be construed as the title of a judge. You notice what he says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now we have a very bad habit of reading a text like that and immediately construing it to be a reference to the second coming. The Bible teaches the second coming of Christ. It is part of the New Testament content, but not every reference to the coming is the second coming. This one manifestly is not. When Jesus said that to Caiaphas and those who were gathered, they immediately identified that statement. You're going to see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven with a very well-known, somewhat disputed text that was nevertheless absolutely commonly familiar to those who were there and to most of the people in Israel at the time, a text in Daniel chapter 7, which Jesus virtually quotes. And I guarantee you, everyone in that room who heard Jesus say those words thought of that text. There's no way they couldn't have. It would have been the first thing that came to their mind. Daniel said, Daniel chapter 7, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus said, I am, and you're going to see the Son of Man at the right hand of God coming with the clouds of heaven. You're going to see whatever it was Daniel referred to in the seventh chapter of his prophecy. Oh, and by the way, what was Daniel referring to? Well, he explains a little bit more about it. It clearly is not the consummation of the kingdom at the end of history. It's the establishment of the kingdom at the beginning of kingdom history is, is fairly clear from this text. He, the Son of Man, came to the Ancient of Days. In Trinitarian terms, we'd say came to the Father. They brought him, the Son of Man, before him, the Father. Then to him was given dominion. You see, this is the beginning of a kingdom. To the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, okay, I'm the king, all authority is given unto me. Go make disciples of the nations because that is what has been given me as the king. And so the disciples go out under the full assurance that his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one that shall not be destroyed. What Jesus says to those people in that room who were familiar with that text is what you are doing right now is, is establishing the kingdom, and they unwittingly are the ones who are actually without realizing it, and certainly without intending it, implementing the establishment of that kingdom by seeing to it that the heart of it, the new covenant paschal lamb, is going to be offered in a cutting sacrifice, a cutting ceremony, before that morning is over. Jesus says, you're going to see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. That's judgment language, and Jesus is now owning that not only is he the Christ, not as only is he the, the um, Son of God, but he's this Son of Man character. So now we have a third title in play, Christ, Son of God, Son of Man. Pontius Pilate, interestingly, will add a fourth one. He'll ask a leading question. So, you're the king of the Jews. Now we've got a fourth one. We have others in Daniel, the son of David and others. You, you, you know, you're familiar with all of those. There was a big debate in the first century. Are all of those titles in the Old Testament referring to different characters? Or could it be they're all referring to one character? Is there one person in mind or several here? 
when we hear of the son of David, the son of, you know, the, the, the Messiah, the, 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 this and that. Who, are these all one? And Jesus, of course, gives the defining answer. All of those were different lenses through which this one supreme, defining character of human history would be understood. The reference to clouds, we in our Western tradition always want to think of clouds, like a cloudy day, you know, uh, and certainly clouds were visible. The Shekinah glory of God in the Old Testament was a sort of cloud thing, but it was also commonly used, in fact, probably more commonly used to refer to the imagery of judgment. There are countless texts in the Old Testament that bear this out. I'm just giving you one to remind you of how common it is. This is Daniel I'm sorry, Psalm 97. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies all around. This is all judgment language. And for God to come in clouds was simply a way of saying God is coming in judgment. And all of this imagery would more or less serve that purpose. When Jesus said to these men, you're going to see the Son of Man, the Christ, the Son of God, coming with clouds. They interpreted that as that, that is meaning, you're going to see me coming in judgment. They couldn't believe it, but in fact, of course, as you're well aware, is exactly what happened within that generation. Well, Caiaphas didn't dig that action. The high priest tore his clothes and asked rhetorically, what further need do we have of witnesses, this rather dramatic, common, ancient Near Eastern display of outrage and grief? Caiaphas thinks he just won. He just got Jesus to do exactly what he wanted. The leading question worked. He got Jesus to walk right into the trap, you know, because Jesus affirmed blasphemously that he was indeed the Son of God. And we know from other texts that from their point of view, to make a claim to be the Son of God was tantamount to making yourself equal to God. That's the way they took it. That's why they construed it as blasphemy. So Caiaphas says, you've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. I wonder if anyone in the room actually thought for a moment, maybe it's true. <laughs> did anyone think of, anyone in that room, did it cross their mind for a half a second? I wonder if it's true. What if it's true that this man that we are muscling and beating up on and abusing and spitting and all of this abuse that we're pouring, what if it's true? that this guy is exactly who he's now audaciously claimed to be. I think we assume, looking at it from the outside, that none of them really entertain that thought. On the other hand, I have to remind you of the parable Jesus told on Tuesday of the very same week in which we find ourselves now, on Friday morning, Tuesday of that week when Jesus was in the temple. Remember, this was a long time ago. It was only three days ago in the text. It was about six months ago in the class. You know, that's how fast we're moving. But on Tuesday of that week, Jesus gave the judicial verdict. Remember that? Your house is left to you desolate. Not one stone left upon another. Jesus delivered the verdict, however, most poignantly through a parable. And it was the parable of the vineyard in which all these guys had come to collect the revenue, the dividends from the operation of the vineyard. They've all been abused, killed, tortured, whatever. Finally, the owner says, well, they'll respect my son. And he sends his son, as Jesus tells the parable. And in the parable, it says of the tenant farmers, who are these religious leaders, when they recognized him, they said, hey, let's get rid of this guy. We can seize the vineyard for ourselves. I have a hunch that down deep inside, those guys knew that it was true. And they actually embrace the 
unbelievable, insane idea that they could beat God. That's why Gamaliel had to warn them. I doubt that he was in this room at this time. But later he would say, look, you guys, you keep on this path. You may find yourselves in a war with God. And I just wonder if in the insane, outrageous momentum of the moment, that's actually what was in their heads. Who knows? But one thing is for sure. They took a course of trying to do everything they could to get rid of this man. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, to beat him, to say to him, prophesy! And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. When Jesus had been on his way to Jerusalem, you recall three different occasions between Caesarea Philippi and the triumphal entry Jesus had said to his disciples, when I get to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen to me. And he described in rather distinct detail the very things that are mentioned here. So, he experiences what he predicted. He also experiences what Isaiah had predicted back in chapter 50 of his prophecy. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks, to those who plucked out the beard. I didn't hide my face from shame and spitting. Notice the active player here is Jesus. I gave my, this is Jesus voluntarily submitting himself to this. He's nobody's victim. He could have at any moment just got up and said, okay, I'm out of here. Enough of this nonsense. He could have done that. Nothing prevented. He was God among us. He could have walked out the door. No one could have stopped him. But he voluntarily allows himself to go through this abuse. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. And we can't help but be moved by this sight. One commentator said, Such has been the treatment of Christ throughout history, except for the millions who fall at his feet to worship him as Lord and liberator in the most deep and significant sense. Jesus divides the crowd. There are those who fall on their knees. I hope every one of us in this room would count ourselves among those who indeed have fallen on our knees at his feet and acknowledged him as Lord and King and God. There are those who have maligned him, insulted him, rejected him, avoided him throughout history. There are a whole lot of people that try to find some place in the middle, you know? Well, this Jesus, he was a great teacher, good guy, wow, you know, he did some good stuff, and that golden rule, wow, I really dig that, that's wonderful, good stuff, but hey, wait a minute, this business of God among us, come on, that's a little over the top. And I tell you, as complimentary as people try to be toward Jesus, if they're doing anything less than worshiping him, then they are insulting him. They're spitting in his face. If Jesus is God Almighty among us, anything less than worship is an unspeakable insult. And even those who try to be complimentary miss by light years the significance of the one with whom they have to do. Ironically, they say, give us the word of God, prophesy to us. In a sense, they're saying, go ahead, put us on trial, prophet. Give us the judgment, give us the verdict. And that's exactly what Jesus has just done. And those that were in that room, by far most of them, would live to see the sentence carried out in the judgments that fell on that city within that generation. All right, well, meantime, back at the ranch. Peter is outside. I'm calling this the Messiah abandoned. So we've had the Messiah alone, agonizing, arrested, arraigned, and now abandoned by his closest and most fervent supporter and cheerleader, Peter, who was below in the courtyard when one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, you were, you were with Jesus, that man from Nazareth. 
But he denied it, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand anything you're saying. And he backed out into the forecourt, and the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, he was one of them. But he again denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you were one of them, you're a Galilean. But he began to curse and swore an oath, I don't know this man, I don't know what you're talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. So one of the servant girls comes by as Peter is out warming himself. One of those gripping stories, I think you'll agree, in all the Bible. Not that Peter had been unbrave. Is that a word? I don't know. Is that a word? Unbrave. <laughs> Peter had pulled out a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane and launched into the fray against people that had swords and clubs. He was ready to make good on his promises. He'd followed at a safe distance right into the belly of the beast. He was there, you see, in the courtyard of Caiaphas, so you have to give him a little credit where credit is due. I think probably he was sitting there plotting his next move while he was at the fire. He was thinking, okay, how can I do this? He was all of a sudden, when can I make my grand entrance and deliver Jesus and win the day and make good on my promises and show that Jesus for once was wrong about me? I thought he was probably swirling in those kinds of speculative you know, musings about what uh, he was going to do. He still hadn't learned a lesson that we all have to learn. We all have to learn this. He learned it somewhat more dramatically, maybe, than many of us do, but we all have to get to this point of recognizing, in Peter's case, that the unimaginable privilege that had been promised to him by Jesus would only come when he'd gone through unbearable brokenness. Peter had to understand that he was going to have great privilege and it would have nothing to do with his virtue, his courage, his heroics, none of it. Because he had to be squeezed to the point that he saw how completely inept, paralyzed he was before he could possibly shoulder the responsibilities that Jesus gave him. So he's out in the courtyard, that horseshoe-shaped area, and a servant girl. This is a slave girl. Caiaphas was an extraordinarily wealthy man. He had quite a staff of servants and slaves, and she was probably in her mid-teens. That's the impression you get from the description. One of the most humble, nondescript servants of the high priest, probably serving drinks out there around the fire, you know, to these people that had just arrested Jesus. That's what she's doing. One commentator made an interesting analysis of what happened. Peter's swirling in his little thoughts, and all of a sudden the silence of his thinking is broken by this girl who just says, oh, you were with Jesus, and he feels panic. Panic, and he recognizes the hostile environment that he's in the middle of right now, and the crowd begins to look at him, and he feels that pressure, and he's been absorbed with himself all this time, and all of a sudden all of these forces kind of collide, and Peter cracks. She saw Peter warming himself and said, you were with Jesus of Nazareth. He was in the light of the fire, and she examined him, and just those little words, you were with Jesus, were sufficient to embarrass Peter, even though spoken by this humble servant girl. I just want you to think for a moment. This same Peter who is embarrassed by a remark by a servant girl in three months from this time is going to stand in front of the very people who are railroading Jesus to his execution just a little ways away. This same Peter is going to stand in front of those people who were the most hostile, entrenched enemies of Jesus this same Peter is going to stand before them and speak with such clarity, such power, such courage that Luke tells us in the book of Acts 
they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained, blue-collar fishermen from Galilee, and they realized they had been with Jesus. A little girl says, you were with Jesus, and Peter wilts. Three months later, this whole body of powerful political characters will recognize G that Peter had indeed been with Jesus. What a, what a change, huh? I don't think the description in Acts could have ever happened quite the way it did if we hadn't also had the moment in the courtyard of Caiaphas. The girl says, you were with Jesus of Nazareth. That's a common phrase, we hear it a lot, but in Mark, not so much. This is only the third time he's used that expression in the Gospel. Every time Mark strategically uses it, apparently, to tie us to the most famous Nazarite of the Old Testament. In fact, that's kind of the distinct way Mark puts it, Jesus the Nazarite. In the Old Testament, the most famous Nazarite was Samson, the strong man, and that's how Mark sort of introduces it each time in some subtle way to remind us of the strong man of the Old Testament. And Jesus comes as the greater Samson, the greater strong man. He himself says, I've come to plunder a strong man because, in effect, I am a greater strong man. Here we see the strong man Jesus contrasted with the weak man Peter. You see, you were with Jesus the strong man. You weak man is kind of implied in the way the question is put to him. But he denied it. I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he backed out toward the porch. Two Greek words here are used. The first one, I don't know, that's a word that implies factual knowledge. It'd be like saying, I never heard of the guy you're referring to. The next word, understand, implies conceptual knowledge. It'd be more like saying, I can't even make out what you're saying, you see. In other words, you can't imagine a more comprehensive repudiation and disowning of any connection to Jesus or knowledge of Jesus that could come out of the lips of this man at that moment. The last phrase, I don't know what you're saying, is spoken in Greek in such a way that every word has emphasis. I don't know what you are saying. And he's backing away, moving away from the courtyard. And the drama unfolds. The servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this was one of them, but he denied it again. A little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, you've got to be one of them, you're a Galilean, your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and to swear, I'll be damned if I've ever heard of this man you're talking about only I'm sure it's much worse. His speech betrayed him, his accent. Peter from Galilee had a Galilean accent. Genteel sophisticates who lived in Jerusalem teased the Galileans for their accent. There were words they couldn't pronounce correctly. Candy and I like to watch a couple of shows that are produced in Australia, and we make fun of their accent, you know. They probably speak better than we do, but we all recognize accents. You can recognize a New York accent, a Brooklyn accent. If you're good, you can distinguish even parts of the Northeast. My mother was from the South, as was my dad. Uh, people told me she spoke with an accent. I never heard it. It was just my mother, you know. I just thought the way she, that's the way she talked, but... She had that kind of southern accent right through to the end of her life. There's a Texas accent. I've actually been interested in accents for a long time. I've done some study of it, and I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you know it, but there's only one place in the world that doesn't speak with an accent. You know where? Pacific Northwest. We have no accent. Everybody else speaks funny, but uh, somehow we have escaped accents. Well, Peter had an accent, but I'm going to tell you one thing. When he began to turn the air blue in his repudiation of what he was being 
accused of, nobody misunderstood. Nobody missed it. It's remarkable, Peter would somewhere in the book of Acts, chapter 10 in fact, say, nothing unclean has ever, en- has ever entered my mouth. I've never eaten anything unclean. He could never say the same thing about what came out of his mouth, though. <laughs> you know. Jesus in Mark chapter 7 had made that dramatic statement. It's not what goes in a man's mouth that defiles him. Hmm? It's what comes out, because out of the heart come the words that reflect the snake pit of corruption that lies in every one of us. And but for the grace of God, we would be right there with Peter. We need to labor under no delusions of how hopeless we are apart from grace. Paul says, while we were dead, God made us alive. Not while we were trying to make ourselves better and clean ourselves up and turn over a new land. No, no, we were dead. He made us alive. So, if nothing else, we can appreciate and identify with this poor bloke who, at this point, proved how little he really had. Paul said, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Well, it was at that moment that the rooster crowed again, and then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And he thought about it and wept. The phrase thought about it is literally fell up on it. It implies the idea of a complete breakdown, falling, collapsing on the truth of what is just now rushed into his memory. Matthew and Luke both say he didn't simply weep, but he wept bitterly. And the phrase suggests the belief that Peter had at that moment that he had just forfeited everything. Peter thought he'd become a lost soul at that point. Peter thought he was beyond redemption at that point. Peter thought that for all the insider benefits that he had enjoyed with Jesus for the last three years and all of the great promises that Jesus had made to him, he had just kissed it all goodbye right there, right then, cursing and swearing, disowning Jesus. He thought it was over. And it was the bitter weeping of utter despair at what he had just given away. I think Mark tells the story in such gripping terms because he wants to encourage his congregation who's facing persecution and meeting it with mixed responses which has been true through Christian. Not every Christian has been heroic, you know. I mean, we get a lot of mixed responses. How would I respond if all of a sudden I was being threatened with unspeakable torture and death? You know, I'd like to think by God's grace, I'd hang in there, but I don't know. I'm not going to make any promises to you here. How would we respond? And the people in Mark's church were sometimes beating themselves up because they were feeling uneasy, a little bit... Nervous about the prospects that lie before them, and Peter wants them, or Mark wants them to know that, you know, no one's immune to lapse, but he also wants them to understand no one is beyond the promise of grace. That it's grace that holds us up. What can separate us from the love of Christ? That's the question, you see, that should always be our um, uh, source of confidence. One commentator said it was now and only now that Peter was qualified to be an apostle. At the very moment that Peter thought he had eternally disqualified himself from being an apostle, let alone the leader, it was at this moment that he finally was truly qualified. Because at this moment he had to despair of anything in Peter. He continues, quote, Mark does not include Peter from this point on. And evidence of Peter is the source. Peter is not trying to paint a heroic picture. This is the last time we run into Peter in Mark's gospel, period. 
This is what Peter wants us to know about Peter. Now, we probably otherwise know it. He turned out to be a pretty important guy, you know? There's, what, 10,000 cathedrals named for the guy around the world right now, and more are being built probably as I speak. But Peter doesn't want us to be thinking. He wants us to realize that he and we alike, left to ourselves, are desperately unable to deliver the goods. So, the commentator says uh, this was the beginning of Peter's real role as leader of the band. He had to be utterly broken before he was qualified to lead. So we have this interesting irony. The most precise confession of Jesus' identity came from the high priest. Caiaphas gives the most accurate statement as to the identity of Jesus, while Peter gives the most eloquent repudiation of it. It won't be long, however, before roles reverse. Luke tells us of the first time that Peter is hauled before the Sanhedrin, the same people orchestrating the execution of Jesus, the same Peter who had failed so miserably in the front courtyard of the guy who's leading the charge against Peter right now in the Sanhedrin, gives Peter a chance to speak, and he says this, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom you crucified, whom you, Caiaphas, crucified, whom God raised From the dead by him, this man stands here before you. This is the stone which you builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone of the true temple. The temple in which you take such pride, its days are numbered. That house is left to you desolate. Not one stone will be left upon another. And it's coming pretty soon. The true temple is the one of which Christ is the cornerstone. There is no salvation in any other. Because, my friends, there is no other name under heaven whereby a man can be saved. So Peter and Caiaphas begin to swap places is hanging on to the ship Titanic, which will inevitably go down. Peter is leading the true people of God into the New Covenant era. Sunday school lesson, hopefully these are fairly obvious. There's a time to speak and a time to to serve. You know, a time to speak, a time when service is our speech. We should learn to make the distinction. Paul says when we're going through difficult times, abusive times, We should learn the fine art of overcoming, not being overcome by evil, but overcoming evil with good. There's always potential for failure in Christ's service. We have to live constantly in the sober self-understanding that we, without Christ's grace, ain't gonna make it. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears fruit. Without me, nada. The moment we feel we are disqualified from serving Christ may be the moment at which we become truly qualified. On a personal note, when I came to this church in 1980, I was in the middle of a marriage that was breaking up. It was a dark, horrible time in my life, and I came to this church to escape. I didn't want anyone to recognize me. I just wanted a place to hide out and not be known. And I've been hiding out here for 40 years now, you see. And I don't know that I really appreciated what a complete loser I was until those days in 1980. Now, it's come back to me a few times over the years, you know, but that was a turning point. I'm not going to say it was anything on the order of what Peter went through, but for me, it was something like it. I thought I had forfeited the right to teach. I've been told that by plenty of people. You don't get a divorce and then wind up teaching. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Those were the circles I was moving in. And I believed it. And I came here not to teach, just to hide. Just to hide. 
And God in His grace has been covering me, providing that hiding place for me for 40 years. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to Jesus, to this church, and to you, my friends, for uh, uh, creating this wonderful place in which uh, we can all learn lessons like that.